Okay, I'm Anthea Caddy, and this is Mio Gladovich. We're both artists. Um, also, Mio is a very, very skilled um, engineer and designer of odd technical devices, which is probably more artistic than me. Anyway, um, we're going to talk about the project that we worked on together, which was uh, a co-production from the Spatial Media Labs uh, Reimagine Europe project and the Australia Council for the Arts and Sonic Axe Festival. So I'm pro I, sp I will start at the beginning about me. Um, so I am a cellist of sorts. I actually um, have a degree in media arts. So I specialize in electroacoustic works for cello, any kind of amplification. And in specifically, I'm interested in, in media that can explore ideas of sound and projection and how that may be able to be expanded through different forms of media or more, more explored more in a more precise way rather than just a straight uh, mic microphone and stereo projection. So um, I started off wanting to use my cello as a means to explore specifically projection. So I did a lot of um, recording with different devices, just stereo, mono, um, sound field, like multi-channel, um, in different um, environments in Australia. For example, like a, a very large cavernous um, um, hydroelectricity scheme um, wall, dam wall, and then like an anechoic chamber, a six second reverb um, physics research chamber within the university. So I, I began to explore what what could happen with a, a resonant device, the cello, and how what, what would happen if I put it in different spaces. This was in a period of time when everyone was really into like software development <laughs> and like Timberland and wanting to like make really high-end productions, you know, software had become readily available to ev the every man. So I decided, well, why would I, and also hardware, well, why would I use a lexicon when I can actually make my own natural reverb or find it? Obviously, this is very specific to Australia where space is of a premium. <laughs> I mean, not a premium, so we, we can go different places and find a lot of different ways to record. So yeah, then I recorded in a forest and, and it went on. Um, I then moved to Europe and found that it was more of a performance landscape and began to then explore more of a projection in performance rather than recording. And so um, I started doing very simple multi-channel works for acoustic cello and um, and whatever system was available in those places. Um, bear with me, I'm getting to the point of all of this. Um, and so I started doing a lot of these performances and I became, I started to become very, very bored because I was like, I can only, I can only perform within this, this room that I'm in. I, I can't really go any further with this. I can't, I can't really fuse this cello and this, uh, this, this media any more than I already have and I don't feel like it's enough. So I decided it was time that I actually stepped back from performing solo and started to do some more research. So I got in touch with the media theorist Douglas Kahn who actually specifically deals with uh, a more broader approach to looking at sound or well, temporal media, let's say. Um, so, I started a PhD with Douglas and started to explore ideas of energy that was a more expanded approach of looking at the area of sound. So instead of going, well, I, can't, I can hear it, it's just there, I can only hear it, I began to be able to think about 
sound is just another form of energy in a much broader landscape and environment, which freed me from a bunch of problems, a bunch of limitations, and also a bunch of anxiety about the categorical nature of sound and music. These days, I'm not sure I would say I'm, a, I'm not a sound artist. I'm not sure I'm a sonic artist. I'm just an artist who deals with energy. And I think this is a much better way of approaching this in general at the moment. And I hope that it becomes a, a larger kind of area of exploration because it freed me from a bunch of stuff. So then I started looking at, well, I'm going to use energy as a way to, to find, to develop artworks. And then I realized, well, I don't, need, I don't need to be heard even if I'm using energy. I don't really need to, I'm not sure I really need to be seen. I never really wanted to be seen. So then we start looking at the field of energy. You start to research, well, energy is everywhere. It's around us. Sound energy is here. We can't hear it. Obviously, we're not hearing very low sound frequencies at the moment. We're only hearing really a very small amount of what is actually occurring in our environment as you know here. So I started to use this. And I, then I started to want to harness this energy much more specifically. And I wanted to use the energy within the cello that obviously, um, um, what's the word, propagates and projects. And I wanted to, to be able to really fuse the two together with the cello and the system. So actually, there's some photos of, if you go back, there's a few photos of, <laughs> there's the Lyman cycle, that's something we should talk about. The, the Schlieren and the Modes. So I did a bunch of research. I started with the cello, and I found there was a massive gap in research about how uh, the energy within the cello actually happens. It's actually called, it's a, it's a yeah. This is a, a very basic um, diagram of some of the resonance within, is that the cello? Yeah, yeah within the cello, so I haven't looked at this for a while. <laughs> um, so I started to research all this stuff, and I realized that what I thought, what I assumed within the physics was already like worked out and very clear, wasn't. There was a massive gap of like what happens to the, the sound waves within the, within the cello before they come out, and then also what happens when they come out. So I also have a, yeah, these are the modes. So these are modes of frequency that are within a cello, different areas of modes. So I began to look at these different diagrams and understand that actually I could begin to manipulate through performance and also through technology how these modes were being shaped, and then what then would be um, projected from the cello. Obviously, a cello is an acoustic instrument that, that you presume you can hear what is being played. When you start using amplification and you start using other devices that magnify sound, you can begin to really uh, grab other things from that resonant body and project them in other ways. But I found this fascinating. Maybe it's not. <laughs> but yeah, so we started to look, and then I started to look at what happens outside of the cello when the sound comes out of the F holes. This is a projection of where the sound goes. So I decided I really wanted to be able to manipulate this, this projection and find a way to really start dealing with different frequencies and expanding the energy propagation out of the cello through media and then to find out how that energy then travels within an environment. And I mean any environment. It can be an anechoic chamber where very little happens. It also can be like a cliff face. When you start to look at refraction and propagation, what happens through water, this is very fascinating for me as a, just sound. So I then decided I wanted to do a bunch of research into systems that could harness this energy in more powerful ways and how I could actually start to um, really define different frequencies and project them. 
And this is where Mio comes in. <laughs> I did a lot of research into um, speakers and wanted to find, obviously, low, um, very low resonance things, which is another story that I haven't done yet. Um, but I started looking at stadium speakers and how they might, how they threw voice and sound. Obviously, voice and cello is very similar frequency range, so. And I started looking at Maya long throw technology, which I was really interested, which basically used a parabole. Ah, uh, yeah, we have to talk about this. Used a parabole to um, um, harness the energy and throw it. At the same time, I did a work with Mio, which is here, which you just took away, which also was another way of exploring the resonance in the cello. We used a an accelerometer. Sorry, I'm a bit tired. <laughs> I've got a two and a half year old kid, so I'm like, oh. we used an accelerometer to use, like, really again harness and magnify a bunch of frequencies within the cello. Um, and then we used software, or Mio used software, to actually um, spread this across a bunch of resonant, was 13 or 14 resonant? 20? 20. 20, okay. Um, resonating um, wooden boards, which you can see here. Now you're going to talk about this, Mio. <laughs> well, uh, the picture shows just uh, the system of uh, 20 like uh, resonant wooden boards with re which resonate in a different uh, frequency range based based on uh, on uh, on the modes on the modes that happen in cello that we just saw and ba based on the on the projection projection patterns of different frequency bands in the from the cello so as you saw before they don't go every kind of frequency range goes in a, is in a in a different way in a horizontal and vertical plane, so. Backwards, back. <laughs> yeah, there's some uh, frequency bands that just play behind the cello, so nothing in front of it. And then uh, we decided to try to avoid using a con conventional speaker setup, so because normally you would put a microphone on that spot to just use some uh, amplification. And then we spread this into a space so kind of uh, we had the uh, like enlarged uh, 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 cello body like in the space. So let's say we're trying to recreate the modes that happen in the cello with some elements outside the cello. So that that was uh, some years ago. 2016. I, 2016. Okay. But then uh, we wanted to have this. Uh, long projection of the of the energy and then we started uh, exploring this uh, i mean it's an let's say known phenomena of parabolic shapes that uh, they can focus energy but also they can uh, beam or steer the energy when when the uh, when the energy source is placed in the focal point then the the parabola makes a like a like a beam shaped uh, uh, projection of the energy, but in the in a different uh, direction. If you put a kind of a collector or a microphone in the focal point of a parabola, it will collect all the energy much stronger than a normal uh, find a normal photo. microphone. How do I get? Oh dear. Okay. Can so there are some, let's say, uh, technical or design challenges in the, in a way that. Very, it's very common that you use a parabolic shape to collect sound. It's very used for the microphones. Even in the before uh, radar was invented, most probably people know these uh, sound mirrors that are built at the southeast uh, coast of England, and they would collect from a long distance uh, uh, airplane noise, and then they they would be able to detect where's the if the if the bombing is going to happen or if the airplane is coming or which direction is coming from but uh, so it's quite let's say easy to be to to collect the sound with parabola because the 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 the, the size of the collecting element is quite small but when you have to project then the, 
the the speaker, the size of the speaker can sometimes cover the the projection surface. So you have to, let's say, have a, a small dimension uh, speaker or emitting device, and to be able to use the the whole surface of the parabolic. So we have this. So the the very cheapest test we did is uh, using a satellite dish, which was found somewhere on the garbage. This is our prototype. And starting uh, started building the prototype, and then of course you can see where the where the speaker cone goes. Of course, this is not the ideal size of a speaker. It should be much smaller, but oh, that, that's the one we we could find. <laughs> And this is our primitive stand. So, and immediately we realized that, that something uh, really nice is happening to the sound character of this uh, device, and the way it throws the, especially the high frequency range, is uh, oh, the way it focuses the the energy that would normally spread quite close to the speaker. It's it's really it's something very, special. It's very very powerful. Even this smaller version was really. Yeah, we are talking about really like cheap uh, car speakers. So yeah, it was it was pretty. We we tested it. We did two tests. We did one inside in the club, and one outside on the open field. Yeah, and the club one was quite wild because of course it's so powerful that it 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 it, it the sound behavior is like a laser. So you get you're in the beam. You're spatially when you're in the beam, you really know you're in the beam. <laughs> Yeah. And then you start, we got all these reflections further down into the bar area where there was another room, which were kind of resonating the room, but also collect, like, articulating different frequencies. It was, I mean, it's hard to explain. But it's also, <laughs> so in the, in the field of uh, higher frequencies, you can always use the uh, same principles as are used in the optics and lights. So, uh, the sorry ref refraction or uh, of the beam is pretty much similar to the lights, but when you're outside and then you have the environmental situation with some wind, it's quite interesting how it uh, this beam uh, blends or sticks out from the environmental noise. Just like uh, you become aware of uh, of on the on the side on the sides. <laughs> A bit like that guy. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, the wind started to um, play the beam. I mean, the idea was to make this speaker so that it could travel a really far distance, and it does. This one, we haven't, did we test the longer? No. I wanted to build something that I could put off a lighthouse and put, to, you know, like then have maybe an audience or whoever is walking around on the other side of a river or, you know, really like expand the performance environment. Um, I, pro I, I really like it outside, and we're doing more. The point is, every time you set this thing up, it has a different sonic um, outcome. So <laughs> you don't know what's going to happen. So where's the where's the the, the finished model? I don't the have. The finished model is there should be two folders. No. Back. Zagreb photos. Oh no, image one, two, these ones. These ones here. The one you just, yeah, there you go. So yeah, basically this is the almost finished model. So there are no, not so much limitations in the high frequency range, uh, but there are quite a lot of limitations in the lower range. Mm. And then uh, this, uh, this uh, defines the size of uh, the dish of the parabola. And we somehow calculated to, to go with some uh, fundamental frequencies of cello, so she can still play and steer the low notes. Yeah. Not the really the low, low notes, because that would make the parabola big, like uh, 10 or 15 meters. But we have now have a almost two meter parabola, and it can steer quite low frequencies. I mean, it was surprising. low main frequencies. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that was the issue of, you know, when you start wanting to like harness energy at such a, a powerful um, level, you lose all that bottom frequency. But actually, this so now you can see the size bad. compared yeah. to yeah. Okay. So we built it, and it was perfect. <laughs> of we, course. But we played it inside, right? We played it inside, and this is the next part of all of this. Um, 
so we, it, it was premiered at the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam as part of the Sonic Axe Academy F Festival in February this year. We were very lucky it happened. Um, we set them up in the foyer there, which was the biggest space really in that museum. Um, and there they are, they're sitting on, they, they sit on stands, so they're high enough. But you can also then tilt it and position it. We did a, three days of setting up and testing in the space. And I don't know, what do you want to say about this? Well, it is a kind of inside in the indoor space. It acts like a kind of a, I would say in a technical sense, but it, it's a bit weird. Uh, form like a spatial EQ. So when you move through the space, there's a, you still, of course, because of the nature of the low frequencies, you can hear the low frequencies from basically kind of larger areas. And then uh, when you move through the, pace, through the space, which was the initial idea that we have people moving around, then you enter and uh, exit the beam. But not only the primary beam, you also enter the reflection, reflective beam, and it doesn't quite lose a lot of energy on the way, which is quite interesting. It can have like a secondary, a third, or fourth reflection, and still quite, uh, quite uh, intense energy inside. And that was the interesting part here. Yeah, it really, you were walking through three different rooms, in a sense, like spatially, what you heard. So that was our first live public performance. I initially wanted to do it outside, but of course it's Amsterdam, <laughs> so it's just not even possible. I mean, and then I also wanted to do it on a boat, but of course it's just not possible. Maybe it is more possible these days now that this corona situation has happened. I just found it very bizarre that we designed a system for outside use and also for expanded, like, you know, this, I think this can travel up to like two kilometers. I mean, obviously it in dissipates. In special, special conditions, yeah. Yeah, in special conditions. But it was very bizarre that it got built just before all this happened. Anyway, um, so the next test is now, basically, and I, I think outside is going to be pretty interesting. I don't know what we're going to do exactly. We have to set up and find out. Yeah. <laughs> um, We're good. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> Does anyone have any fo about photos? Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> so we say, yeah, the primary and the secondary. Yeah. I mean, it depends really on what we're playing as well, what I'm playing, but I mean, okay, let's presume it's not as windy as it was yesterday. If it was that windy, it would very be very interesting. <laughs> but, but presumably it's going to reflect all over the square. So you will get, we will get these iterations of different frequencies from the, the parables. And we have two, I, we didn't say that. I mean, obviously it's in the photo. We originally just wanted one in a mono sense. Like I was kind of, let's just do mono. Like I don't want, I don't want any more of this multi-channel stuff. I don't want any more, I just want. But anyway, now we have stereo. Yeah, I was like, I don't want, I just want one beam. It's a classic cellist thing, right? Because if you start looking at the projection of the cellist, it's kind of like this. If I, was a, if I was a trombonist, I'd probably be wanting like multiple. But anyway, we ended up with two. We can build more because we... <laughs> Now we have the we have everything a, ready. For yeah, it. we can just keep building them. But um, yeah, so it really depends where we set up. The thing that I'm kind of curious about is what happens if we cross the beams and if we have more of a reflection. I don't know, we have to find out. It's really hard to know what they'll do. Right? It just moves it. With you, you hear it, it's, it's moving it. So it's very spatial. The whole thing is like, you walk, like, if, if I'm standing here, I walk, there's like, I'm out of the beam, I'm in the beam. It's that clear. It's really like, you know, you a fence, like, boom, boom, you're in, you're out. Then, 
But then you feel it, and then you start to really feel the wind, like that, we see here. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm really, really curious to um, send it across water or reflect it across water, which is, I think, we're going to do in Berlin in the lake. Like, there are, there's just a bunch of environments that I'd like to set it up and see what happens. Like, across a mountain from one to another, or at least, like, some kind of cliff face, really expand it, you know? I really, the idea was to really expand this whole thing to as far as it can go. And if, we, if it's being sent, and even if you don't hear it, it's, this is the point with this energy stuff. I'm going to be inarticulate, inarticulate about this. It doesn't matter if we hear it anymore. <laughs> like, I don't know, maybe I'm becoming far too artistically conceptual. It's there. <laughs> so I was kind of like, well, let's just set it up and like, what? I send it from Berlin to here. Do you hear it? No. Okay, it's gone. But it was there. It propagated. This is the thing. This energy stuff, it propagates. It propagates. It changes. It does something. It keeps going. Like, So yeah, I want to send it across a really big lake to see what happens with the reflection in water. Um, but also what do you want to do? Yeah, for the indoor performances, yeah. we plan to do the... Because... Oh, sorry. Uh, because people, like the uh, shots from the Stedelijk Museum, you see people looking at her performing instead we, of... We need to get rid of me. No, no. <laughs> no, but I want to install so it. So we, we're, we're going to build a kind of a... To make it more performative for yeah. indoor space, kind of a, a motor, so yeah. it, it can rotate while you play. So then the beam can be steered in a, as a part of a composition. So that's the... I, that's the, I would say, next challenge for me. <laughs> yeah, it goes on. And then we get like 20 of them. <laughs> um, the other thing, uh, we got, I mean, we did it within the Spatial Media Lab's research. The support was that you, you have an idea, you explore it, you research it. So we got a lot of support to find, just to do a bunch of research into other long throw technologies. Um, so we did get, I got sponsored by these TOA systems, which was, which we tested on the Tempelhofer Feld Airport, so the Tempelhof Airport in Berlin, which was pretty funny because um, we got a, um, a generator and everyone was worried that we'd get in trouble because they actually patrol it there. And this guy drove up to us and he said, what are you doing? Because they just, we recorded it, so there's a big, that's us. There's the cello. That's the TOA speaker. It's, it's waterproof. It's, it's designed to be installed for out, outdoor um, voice projection stuff. So they gave us one of these, which I still have. So we decided we wanted to test how far it would actually travel on a completely flat um, environment. So we tested it, and it just kept going. <laughs> but that is a different... That's a different design than the Parabol. Um, that had an interesting... Uh, it, it basically just went... The sound maintained its volume for about 200 metres and then dropped off and then you really only got the highs. Yep. That's a, that's so a different uh, that's thing. Our, that's our producer, Anna, who's in the audience. Who was... Would, we wouldn't have been able to do all this stuff without her. So we, um, yeah, so we recorded it to find out what happened along the way. And so, yeah, the, the Tempelhof is another place that... And there's just another expanded environment where you could, for example, put a speaker... I think it's like a kilometre... Two kilometres in length. So you can put a speaker on one side, you could put a speaker on another side. You know, you could really start to, like, build a, a massive sound installation because of the, the power of these speakers. But anyway, yeah, so we, we, we really weren't really sure what, if we were going to build the Parabol, which was initially what I really wanted to build, or if there was already some kind of technology that was available. Funnily enough, the Maya system that I mentioned that had actually a long throw speaker, we thought we would be able to access in Europe, and interestingly, there are none on the continent. We tried to find them everywhere, and it seemed that 
Only it, in Canada. Yeah, only there was eight in Canada and Celine Dion had toured with one. Because, again, it goes back to this stadium thing where we've got to throw sound to, like, you know. <laughs> Celine Dion and Andre Ryu, that crazy violinist dude. <laughs> and I was like, then we really have to build one of these because that's where I want to be. But, <laughs> but, yeah, we couldn't access them. And then they had this newer system that was an SB2 that also... Still not there. Is it there? Is there one? Because they've got a photo and they've, like, just photo photo, yeah. yeah this. Preliminary information. Just. Exactly. So it was there, but it didn't really exist. And so that's, yeah, that was our test in the Tempelhof, which was pretty interesting. So, yeah, we, to answer your question about what, where we're going to take this, it's, it's really, it's in its very, in, it's, in, it's in infancy. Like, there's a lot of stuff we want to do. We just need to get a shite load of funding to do it. <laughs> but I, it's my PhD, so I will be um, publishing this as part of my PhD. So it will, I suppose, go into the academic world yeah. and be buried <laughs> where all other artist PhDs go. Any more questions? Yeah. Uh, what happens at the intersection of two beams? This is this and is the does question. And does the inter intersection changes uh, uh, in relation to the distance of the source? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I understood. So if you have a, uh, a two, two... Yeah. Okay. What happens in that? So if you spot? presumably have a... Depends if you have... It's, there's just a, quite a lot of uh, phasing uh, effects happen because if you have the same distance, then you would have a coherent source. Then it would seem like it's the same sound coming from everywhere around. But it's always a slight distance difference, and there's always like a it's kind of a this uh, dizzy feeling in your head because it's kind of uh, this uh, same sound coming in different timing in the, on your ears, and it's quite strange, I would say. Frequency overload, you said. Yeah, it's like a, well, it's, it's more like if you know what's a phasing issue. So if you have the same uh, signal coming different in different times or this different phase, then it's uh, kind of, uh, it's like, uh, it's really hard to describe. But uh, I mean, subjectively, how you feel. Uh, so it's kind of a, you fear something's wrong or strange, so it's like a perception of this signal is quite quite strange. So, hopefully, we make it uh, on Tuesday. So, we took them in a car all the way from Berlin. They're a hundred <laughs> kilograms in a big box. <laughs> quite heavy guys, but also I just wanted to say that Mio actually designed them to be taken apart. Like the actual, we don't have a photo anymore. It's like a pizza. So it is actually, it folds up, well, folds in, the convex folds in. So I, I just want to say that this is like, as a, as a designer, this is like kind of phenomenal for someone who needs to travel or install. Like, it's amazing. So yeah, it's a four piece. You can thing. see it. And then it can fit uh, like a standard uh, flight case and travel around. And it takes uh, maybe 20, 30 minutes to assemble which is not that bad. Pretty good. <laughs>